I don't want to hold back this morning, Lord, so I, I give my mind to you, the seat of my affections, my desire, the capacity for my reasoning, my logic, everything, Lord. I give it to you. Use my voice as a mouthpiece one more time in Jesus' name. Are you awake? Let's stand up. Maybe you're not awake. That's right. What an honor it is to hear the word of God and then read an entire chapter together. It's awesome. It's a privilege. So I'll start in Daniel Chapter 4, and I'll finish chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful are his wonders. His kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me, and I told him the dream. He was named Belteshazzar after my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. While I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches and the world was fed from this tree. Then as I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. The messenger shouted, cut down the tree and lop off its branches, shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit, chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches but leave the stump and the roots in the ground bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Now let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field for seven periods of time. Let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. For this has been decreed by the messengers. It is commanded by the holy ones so that everyone may know that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives to them anyone he chooses, even to the lowliest of people. Belteshazzar, that was the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so. But you can tell me because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Upon hearing this, Daniel was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. Then the king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. He replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. The tree you saw was growing very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. That tree, your majesty, is you. For you have grown strong and great. Your greatness reaches up to the heavens and your rule to the ends of the earth. Then you saw a messenger a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump and the roots in the ground bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals of the field for seven periods of time. 
This is what the dream means, your majesty, and what the Most High has declared will happen to my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from human society, and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow, and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps you will continue to prosper. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on a flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. As he looked across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, the message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdom of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That same hour the judgment was fulfilled, and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow, and he was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity restored and I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. All the peoples of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. You may be seated. Thank you for your word, Lord. This is a strange chapter of the Bible. Actually, it is the only chapter written by a pagan king. Nebuchadnezzar begins starting really with the theme of the entire text. Pay attention, my handful of hermeneutic students are in the Sunday school in the back. I encourage you to come if you want to learn how to interpret the Bible properly rather than taking a verse and making it your own (laughs) or making it say what you wanted to say. So today we're going to have a theme. You're going to be scholars in the book of Daniel chapter 4. Who's not excited about this? It's the best Father's Day gift ever. Okay. Um, The theme is when when he's declaring all that God has done, how sovereign he is. But something dramatic had to happen in his life before he could really understand or believe this declaration. You have to understand, he was an evil man. He was a stubborn man. Even though there were, met, there were people around him placed, obviously, as we'll see, trying to break through his arrogant mind, there was intense miracles that we've already seen, dreams to warn him about what was going to happen to him in his kingdom. But he was blinded by his pride. He was blinded by his self-sufficiency. And that is the heart of Babylon. 
and the root of what causes destruction in our lives in general, in the unrepentant especially. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So this chapter, it speaks to our personal lives and it also clearly speaks to all the lives of leaders, specifically world leaders, or those with a great amount of power. God is sovereign. He will have his way. Our choice that we have is to be in or out of his ways, of his sovereign ways. And by his grace, we still have time today. It is by his grace that we have even time this morning, precious time to understand this message and apply it to our lives. For Nebuchadnezzar, his time was running out. He was around 80 years old. Not saying if you're close to 80, your time is running out, but if I'm honest, you, you, I mean, never mind, I don't want to make you feel bad. You have till 120, and then you can start worrying about it. This is at the end of his reign. Not long before the prophesied fall of Babylon, I think it's 25 years later, I, I, I could be wrong. He's relishing in his achievements, and he was comfortable. He says it himself. It's a firsthand account. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. That is the state that he was in when this dream gripped him, this warning. And that is the state of the spiritual Babylon, the Babylonian system that we find influencing our entire nation and world. I'll give you a picture of that in, in the New Testament and then a little bit back in the Old and then back to the New Testament. Luke 17, 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Amos 6.1, woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. Revelation 3.17, for you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So like Nebuchadnezzar, so many today are secure in their achievements they're secure in their prosperity. They're secure in their paycheck, their earnings. And there is a striving for a life of comfort. So Nebuchadnezzar is living this way. And he receives a warning to repent again. But like before, he needs someone to help him interpret the dream. You see how stubborn he is in his ways. And this dream is a little bit more obvious. Actually, it's a lot more obvious than the, the other one. So he, he calls in the sorcerers. He calls in, the, he calls in you know, Harry Potter and his, and his friends to help him out. Um, the mystical, magical people. He turns to the world first. And let me give you this in the modern vernacular because we don't typically, when we want advice, I don't know about you, I, I don't know any wizards, so I'm not seeking them out. But it would be equivalent to this. Perhaps going to the newspaper if they still do this. Do they make horoscopes? I'm sure they do. You want a good answer. You want some guidance. Even better... How about this example? You wake up from a troubled dream. You're puzzled what it means. And instead of seeking after God, you pick up your smartphone and Google what the dream means. That, I think that would probably hit closer to home for the time that we live in. 
This all carries into today as the gospel message is the last place that people, including believers, want to go for guidance. Even believers in our fallen flesh, we become entangled in seeking after guidance from the influencers of this world system to interpret to us the deeper things of life or relieve our problems in instantly. We want an instant relief. It is self-deception. These are the days of self Deception. You really don't need too many to deceive you because you will deceive yourself if you are not grounded in the word. And that is the heart of our pride. It keeps us from truly changing. It keeps us from truly repenting. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says in the Amplified, the classic version for the story and message of the cross is sheer absurdity and folly to those who are perishing and on their way to perdition. But to us who are being saved, it is the manifestation of the power of God. The conflict from that verse is when we find people who are supposed to be being saved finding this message absurd by not making it a part of their lives. So back to Nebuchadnezzar, the magicians and the wizards. Really, they didn't have the audacity to tell him the meaning of the dream because they know what it meant. They knew what it meant. Their jobs were on the line. <laughs> this, is a horrible, this is a horrible dream. Finally, in verse 8, Daniel comes in, last resort. But even Daniel, he was reluctant to tell him the meaning for a different reason. He wasn't worried about his job. Obviously, he's not. This, this guy will... You know, him like his friends, he would have thrown himself in the fire. He trusted in his God. Daniel was terrified, the Bible says, not because he was afraid of losing his status, but because he actually cared about Nebuchadnezzar. And you can see that from his voice and in his caring for him. Realized that he'd been the chief advisor to Nebuchadnezzar for 30 years. He's at this job for 30 years, representing godly influence, working and living where God called him to be. What compassion he must have had, really an example of loving your neighbors, working and, and living in this Babylon, Babylonian system and society, right? Right? Now, many believers today, folks, would rather die than work under a tyrannical, evil government leader. Many extreme, I'll call them extreme nationalistic Christians, they cannot handle four years of an ungodly leader, let alone 30. And forget about being a friend to an evil king or exercising compassion nowadays. It's the very things we condemn are what we become when our pride, our self-reliance and obsessions with man and man-made political movements prevents us from doing the very thing we are commanded to do. And what is that? I think it's in Mark 12, 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Colossians 4, 5, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Daniel is making the most of every opportunity. Working, befriending a, this guy was the most evil, one of the most evil leaders in world history. He was idolatrous. I don't want to know what he did in his private life behind closed doors. Probably would be NC-17. Murdering innocent people. And Daniel really cared for this guy. 
Just chew on that for a while. It goes to show us that a lifestyle, and this is from Daniel's lifestyle, he had a lifestyle of prayer. Lifestyle of prayer. Now you could say, well, he did it religiously. Um, it, was, it was more than a religion already for Daniel. This, 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 he really meant it. He really believed it. He really lived it. Time spent with the Father, he understood and obeyed his word. And it, when you do that, it's going to cultivate love in your heart for people that your flesh would normally want to hate. Which is actually the people we were, <laughs> who we all once were. All of us in our own depraved minds once were all little Nebuchadnezzars. And until God dealt with us, and I think he still has to deal with us yet this morning. So Daniel expresses, uh, explains the dream to his friend. This is his friend. This is somebody he cared for. Yes, an evil king. And he doesn't want to do it. He's like, I wish it happened to your enemies. You, you see the heart there. So this dream meant coming judgment for Nebuchadnezzar. If you go to Ezekiel 31, you'll see a similar scene, nearly the same except it's pronouncing judgment on Pharaoh. The tree represents the pride of man. The great empire of Babylon, its economic prosperity, protection, security for the people, great military strength, and influence across the world. That sounds like America to me. I'm not equating it to, maybe I am, I don't know, you figure that out, pray about it. We have great influence. We have great military strength. Other countries too. So that's this tree, the pride of man. Then you have the watchers, which you don't find that, I don't think you find that anywhere else in the Bible, that concept of the watchers, these angelic beings. They're called that because they don't sleep. They're always watching. We sleep. We're limited. They're always watching. And judgment comes through these angelic beings. Decreed by the Lord Most High. The judgment would be that this king is going to become insane. Out of his mind, exposed to the elements. He's going to eat grass from the ground, literally, and the, the word mind, it's, it's a Chaldee word, it's in the Aramaic. Of course, this doesn't mean the muscle in our, our heart, but it means heart in the Aramaic. The definition is the entire disposition of the inner person where your reasoning is. That is something we take for granted, ladies and gentlemen. Every day you take for granted, I do too, that you have a mind that can reason. Un unless you have like a serious mental illness. And that's exactly what he's about to be judged with, if you think about it. Some of us who have lost our minds, we, we can understand that. And you see my expression, I'm serious, because I understand what that's like. If you've ever had psychosis before, I, think I, was, I forgot how old I was. I was in my 20s, and I experienced psychosis once. It's a horrible feeling. You can't think. You're stuck in a thought. Imagine being stuck in the same thought over and over again and having no control over what you thought. It's a scary place to be. You come to appreciate sanity when you have insanity. Psychosis is a severe mental condition in which thought and emotions are so affected that contact is lost with external reality. It says he'll be like this for seven times. Um, there is a little debate about this. It could mean months, but most scholars agree it's seven years. Imagine being like this for seven years until he acknowledged that it is God who is sovereign and in control even 
over our hearts and minds, let alone the positions we're in or the power that we have. Then the stump obviously is a symbol of mercy, restoration, recovery that is promised. So there's hope. There's a glimmer of hope for this evil Hitler-like king. I mean, I just want to make, I want to make you guys clear, clear to you guys that this guy was evil. Daniel still cared about him, and God's still offering a stump of mercy. Albeit a stump, it's mercy. Then in verse 27, Dan- Daniel humbly, respectfully asked Neb- Nebuchadnezzar to hear his counsel. He's his chief advisor. He says, break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. He's saying, repent, change your ways. We have to repent, required, repentance is required, obviously, of our unrighteousness. That's the call of the gospel of Christ right here in the book of Daniel. And it's not just repenting. Changing our actions is one thing because we can do that all day. We, we, like to, we can change. We can adjust our behavior. We also have to break free of the power of our wicked past and our iniquities with a true heart change that is shown in compassion for the lost. That's where the true heart change is. You want to see a fruit in a, if I want to see the fruit in a a mature believer's life, I don't only see good abstaining from sin, I also see a supernatural compassion for the lost. It's not one or the other. They go hand in hand. Many people attempt to live righteously, and they're really proud of it. But you put them in the room with an evil king or an evil person, and you see their compassion eliminated or they'll put on a fake smile and it doesn't really work out too well because you know inside that they don't want to be around that person. It's got to be the heart of God that you allow to change you for that, ladies and gentlemen. This is what happened, had to happen with Nebuchadnezzar. So the king, his call was for us also. If if the king did this repentance thing, like really did it, which I find radical because you're finding the biblical gospel message of repentance all the way back here, in, you know, the 500 B.C.s and stuff, 600 B.C.s. Wow. If he did this, restoration would come. It's the same for us. We are warned week after week. If you come to church or if you're, you're in your Bible, you should be being warned. And many still ignore it. They're justified in their minds by their good deeds but they don't live a life that's really refreshed or revived in the Lord because they have not truly changed. Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Do you see that connection to what he's telling Nebuchadnezzar to do? He didn't get it right away. He's still stubborn. Verse 29. Twelve months later. A year. He's an arrogant dude. He probably forgot. He forgot about the warning. He forgot about the dream. That's because he was still a scoffer at that point. Maybe he was like, we'll see if this actually happens. Yeah, I know that Daniel has this spirit of the holy gods in him, but my kingdom looks pretty good. Sounds like our day. Second Peter 3.3, 3, above all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on since it has from the beginning of creation. And that's another picture of our time in 2023. God has given us all a warning of coming judgment. The warning to repent and turn from our sins and turn to God. 
And not only that, he's given us everything we need to repent, to have the power to change our lives, to turn from sin, and to have compassion for the lost. But humanity goes on thinking everything is okay and that God is okay, now I'm talking to believers, with our habitual and secret sins simply because an angel of death isn't coming down and striking us with flaming fireballs. Right? You know what I'm saying? You wake up and like, oh, everything must be good. All right, God's grace. I'm not dead today. He didn't come and judge me today. I can just keep going. This is kind of the state that Nebuchadnezzar was in for 12 months. He probably gave up maybe the first few months. He was like, okay, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? I'm not going to murder anybody today. I'm not going to do any sacrifices today. And eventually compromise came in and he just kept being the same old Nebuchadnezzar. We are arrogant in our humanity without Christ. We are cocky in our accomplishments. And the towers of Babel, modern day, I'll call them the towers of Babel and technology, they keep being built. And I want to give you a, a, a segue today. I mean, we're even building them to outer space now. Compare that idea with what our modern day leaders are saying. Now this, this just, I, I just, I happened to, from some way it popped up on my computer and it was a live thing, not even something I followed, and I witnessed this today, and I just want you to watch the following clip with spiritual eyes. Go ahead. Um, then SpaceX, the goal is, uh, it's, a, it's a big goal, but it's, we, we want to try to uh, make life multiplanetary, to extend life beyond Earth. And um, I think this is important for a number of reasons, uh, but um, yeah, there's, there's the sort of defensive reason of ensuring that the light of consciousness does not go out. Um, and, and if I, I may, some of these questions, I, if, if I'm going on too long, you feel free to interrupt me, but the... No, no, you can. Okay. You can so, be long. Okay, so, um, you know, pe people do ask me, you know, uh, have I seen UFOs uh, and aliens and that kind of thing? And um, I haven't. Um, and I think I would have seen them by now. Um, so it, it appears that we might, there's, we might be the only consciousness, uh, at least in this galaxy. And, um, and if so, that's kind of a scary prospect because uh, it, it means that the light of consciousness is like a, like a tiny candle in a vast darkness. And uh, we should do everything we can to prevent that candle from going out. So, yeah. And, and, and so, so some of the things, so that means obviously taking the actions to ensure that Earth is good, that Earth is safe and secure for civilization. Um, and it, I think it also means ex ex extending life beyond Earth um, to other planets in the solar system and ultimately to other star systems. Um, and I think that's, that's both a sort of defense of the light of consciousness and also, um, I think, a point of inspiration because the, the, life cannot just be about solving um, one problem after another. We need things that inspire us. I mean, we need things that you know, move our heart. And that when you wake up in the morning, you're excited to be alive. And being a space-bearing civilization and making true the things that we see in the good science fiction movies, this is one of the things that I think can inspire all of humanity. Just like the, you know, when, when the um, astronauts went to the moon in 69, it was something that I mean, they said for all mankind, you know, and it really was something you say to any human on Earth, what's, the, what is, what's like the most amazing thing that humanity has ever done? A lot of, at least one of those things would be, we went to the moon, you know? And so you want to have these inspiring things that make you excited to be alive and excited about the future. Um, yeah. And you, you had those uh, thoughts 
had dreams uh, when you were a kid, or this came uh, much later on? Well, I didn't think I would be doing these things as a kid. Um, that's for sure. I was interested in technology. And I was read a lot of books. Um, so I was obviously interested in science. I mean, this is, not, this is hardly going to be surprising. I was interested in science fiction and technology. You have to tell the truth because there is someone <laughs> yeah. who is listening to you. Huh? Yeah, my mom's right there. She can, <laughs> she can call me out on this if it's not, not accurate. But um, so I, I guess the. The thing that was maybe um, most significant from a philosophical standpoint was that uh, when I was about maybe 12 or 13, I had somewhat of an existential crisis where I was like, I was like, what, what is the meaning of life? Is life just meaningless? Why are we here? What does it all mean? And um, I read a lot of books on religion and philosophy, and um, and then ultimately, the, you know, I read. This book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is great, um, and, and in that book, that book is really a, a, a philosophy book that's disguised as humor. And the point that Douglas Adams makes is that the the real difficulty is understanding what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe, um, and that we, we that that really we want to. We want to have it's it's, it's essentially a, it's it's like a philosophy of curiosity, um, of of saying well, what can we do to find out more about the, the nature of the universe and um, and the meaning of life, and so it, 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 that's that's the sort of foundational element. And then from there, you say, okay, well, if we want to find out the meaning of life, we have to expand the scope and scale of consciousness. We have to go out there and we explore the stars to to know what questions to ask. Um, about the universe and, and understand the universe, and that's that's my core philosophy. Um, and 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 so from that, it was like, well, we have to make sure that uh, Earth is good, so we have to have sustainable energy. Um, we um, we want to build technology to travel beyond Earth, and uh, that's it's, it's from that sort of core philosophy that these companies uh, arise. The philosophy that these companies are built on is that we have to take care of Earth and we have to make sure, do, do you hear it? Do you hear the pride in there? Is Elon Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not, I don't know about that, but his rhetoric is, it's similar to all great men of power desiring to reach the heavens and extend humanity's light of consciousness forever or even inspire us. God already extended our existence beyond earth. And his word is already here to inspire us. A, a sci-fi cannot really do that, so Elon needs to go pick up the Bible again. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he's looking all around him, a year after this crazy dream, and it was a gorgeous sight. He, he saw the empire that he had built, something we, can, we can't even imagine. The famous hanging gardens behind me of Babylon, they look something like this. We, we have some archaeological evidence and then an artist's rendition. And even as he's thinking the words before they come out, Verse 30, boom, a voice from heaven, and now the first person account that he's reading stops while he's driven away like a madman, like cattle, like an ox or a cow. And this is no fairy tale. This is, this is a real condition R.K. Harrison, an Old Testament Bible scholar, actually witnessed this same condition, which is called boanthropy, in a British mental hospital in 1946. He saw a man in his early 20s in good body, bodily health, but he was very antisocial, and he spent whole days from dawn to dusk outdoors on the institutional grounds. This is back in the day when we had like real institutions like this. 
He was limited in his ability to care for himself, so someone always had to wash and shave him. They gave him water from a clean container so he wouldn't drink from the mud puddles. But as he wandered over the grounds, he would pluck up chunks of grass to eat. He never ate the cuisine that the other inmates ate. It's depicted here in the famous William Blake painting, but it's worse than that. And the seven years really lines up with his hair being that long and his nails being that long. Now, like I said, we can't imagine this reality this morning because we have the capacity to reason. We have the things that make us human and not animal. The ability to question our existence and create, to choose between good and bad and express in words, even as I'm doing this morning, it's, it's an incredible thing. It's, it's the thing that makes us special as human beings. Far above any other created thing. Psalm 8, 4, what is man that you think of him and a son of man that you are concerned about him Yet you have made him a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. We're special to God. And we have the account of how he created us in his own image to rule and have dominion here on earth. And yes, this is the only planet with life he even said it. So if you believe in aliens, Elon said, he's like, I just haven't found it. This is the only, this planet is special. Earth is special because God created it and designed it that way. And the biblical account is true. He created us to think deep thoughts and fellowship and love one another and laugh and do all the things that only special creatures marked with the image of God can do. But what happened? Sin deformed it. Sin deforms everything. It's the pride of our hearts because we simply wanted more. It wasn't enough. Eve wanted to be like God, and really Lucifer, who's a created being, uh, before her, the, the pride of our hearts deceives us into self-sufficiency. But unlike Satan, we still have a chance. And that makes him really, really, really mad. He, he doesn't want you to have a chance. And I'm closing. Jesus was sent to show us how much God loves us to direct our hearts to the personal, all-powerful God who desires to commune with us. If we but acknowledge him and live our lives for him, repent from our wicked ways and love others into the kingdom. Now, in the end, 80 years old, he, Nebuchadnezzar finally got it. What a long time to wait. He died in 562 BC. History tells us. Now, he, when he came out of this thing, he could have cursed God for that. That's it. What he had just been through? Imagine seven years eating grass, wandering around like an animal, not able to even think. All you're able to do is like, it's just trapped. It's crazy. But he chose to glorify God. After the time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, my sanity restored, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, not mine. His kingdom is eternal, not mine. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? So 
every world leader from whether a Musk or a Trump or a Biden or a King Charles, they need to take this chapter of the Bible and read it every single day and start before they start listing off all their accomplishments and all their accolades because God will in the end be made known as the sovereign rule of these finite empires that we all get wrapped up in. They all need to repent and acknowledge who the one true and living God is. Now every person, because we're not all world leaders, most of us probably will never be. Um, He loves us the same and he calls us to the same this morning, folks. So I ask you, what is the tree of pride in your life? The tree of self-sufficiency that has built up? What, What things have in your life have you been turning to or trusting in to give you your purpose and meaning? It could be something as lowly as your device, your smartphone, your house, your relationship, your car, I don't know, your career, anything. What has it been? What sin is separating you from the real presence of God this morning? Do you know that judgment is coming for us? For me and for you. Judgment is coming for us. We have to understand. Do you know the warning is still the same for us? Now don't wait. (laughs) Don't wait until God has to humble you. Like these extreme cases... When God already humbled himself at the cross to make the greatest point of all, there is a better way and it is found in him. Nothing else. Close your eyes this morning, please. Abandon yourself from this world system and return, return to God. Repent, you have to change your mind, your heart, the seat of affection that makes you a human being. You have to change that. He will not change it for you. He will use circumstances to humble you, but that is only out of his grace and his mercy. But believer, you don't have to wait for that moment. You can humble yourself right now and change your heart and repent. You can break off of your sin this morning by living in righteousness. Forsake that hyper grace message that is telling you that you can continue in that sin tomorrow that you know is separating you from God and then you can just come and ask for forgiveness and it's all good. You are never going to be free if you live like that. And somebody lied to you telling you that you don't have to change and it's gonna be okay. It is not okay. God demands righteousness and holiness from you because he wants to use you and he wants you to be set free from the bondage of sin. Separate yourself from iniquity also by showing mercy to others. As Daniel did, even befriending an evil ruler for 30 years. But you can't love people. You know it this morning. There's people you hate right now. If that's the pride of your heart, the great sin of pride, it's blinded you to the lost and those needing to know the grace and mercy of God. Listen, if you forsake that, and you can open your eyes again, just for a moment. If you forsake that, they're gonna see Christ in you. They're gonna see the compassion and, and, and they will escape. You will cause somebody else to escape judgment in the end. I, I'm warning this church probably for the 25th time. You have to sever your addiction to the news and media. I don't care if it's Fox News. 
all it will do if you obsess with it and then you make it your every waking moment is make you really angry and get you upset at the Nebuchadnezzars of the world instead of being compassionate to them. You have to break this cycle. God is not gonna do it for you. It's your choice and you have to turn back to his word. That doesn't mean you're forsaking your values, okay? You, you need to hear this this morning. These kingdoms are going to burn and die and crumble and all that's left is you and the kingdom of God. So that's a mission that sounds way more important than colonizing Mars to preserve our species. How about entering into eternity that Jesus already paid for us to be in? Now, no world leader or tech giant can promise you that because it's a great commission not a mission for one man or one movement. And the best part is we get to populate the heavens anyway. Beyond this earth and realm, but it's gonna be God's doing and not ours. Return to Christ today, the God who rules, and let him rule your life. Let him rule your life, men as fathers. Let him rule your eyes when you're on the internet and your wife and kids aren't around. You need to repent of that thing this morning and you never have to pick it up again. And surely I'm speaking to someone this morning. Not that I'm reading your mail, it's the Holy Spirit reading your mail. He needs you, man of God, to live a life of integrity so that you can be an example and not live in shame and fear and guilt. All your hidden sin turn to him and he's going to do what he promised he'll restore you he restored Job and he restored Nebuchadnezzar two drastically different men your self-sufficiency your your paychecks your your worldviews your politics your preoccupations all your hidden sin you have to tear them down you have to cut down the tree of pride and you know what you're going to see a stump of mercy is going to remain as it did in that old dream, guarded by God, protected by him, his mercy, still here, and he promises new life and restoration in the end for all those who turn to him. That will happen to you. That is not my promise. It's a promise from uh, the God of the universe in the Bible. Personally, subjectively, my experience, I lost everything even at times my sanity, lost most of my family, and God restored to us a family and a a spiritual family on top of that. He will do it. It's not going to be in the way that you define. Job 14, 7, this is Job. He says, for there is... There is hope for a tree when it is cut down that it will sprout again and its shoots will not fail. There's hope for you today. Will you choose to humble yourself today? Would you stand with me this morning? It's a hard thing this morning. I wish we had an hour to just just get on our knees and repent. But it's time, guys. It's running out. This world is spinning out of control. People are too busy to even think, let alone read their word and pray. And it's affecting us. We still have time. The word says in Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Don't wait 12 months. Don't wait 12 minutes. Don't don't wait 12 years. His mercy is here now to meet you by the blood of the Lamb, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, the rule of heaven. It's already started. It's here. And the warning of judgment, it it has not changed since Daniel, not since Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon, not for America or the world. It's very simple. I'll close in it. It's Acts 17, 24. The God who made the world and everything that is in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath in all things. 
And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his descendants. Therefore, since we are descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere need to, are to repent because he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man with a capital M, that's Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. The time is already furnished. That means it's set. It is going to happen. I ask you this morning, what will you do with your life when you leave here? What will you lay down this morning? What tree will you cut down before God has to cut it down for you? And it's going to be a great pain for you. You do not have to wait. Today is a day of salvation. Today is a day for repentance. Let's close our eyes one more time. Come on. By the sound of my voice, led by the Spirit of God, today, you are ready to make the decision. I'm not talking about a sinner's prayer, really. I am talking about the decision to repent, to turn from whatever has been controlling your mind, keeping God out of your purview, out of your periphery, let alone the center of your life. Will you repent this morning? Will you raise your hand and say, yes, I will. Guess what? I'm raising my hand right now because I have something to repent of. This is called collective group repentance. This is what happened in all these great places where the gospel was spread. You can put your hands down. You're just expressing that, yeah, I'm taking action. Let's just pray together. Let's pray together. I didn't plan this, guys, so just repeat after me. It's pretty simple. You believe this in your heart. It's a starting point for you. Lord Jesus, I repent this morning. I turn from my sin. I lay down my pride and I give my life to you. I tear down the high places, every form of idolatry, everything that's high and lofted up, lofty, that sets itself up against you. I lay it down. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. We repent this morning. God, it's a small sign of repentance, Lord. We owe you a lot more. But that's good, Father. I pray it's a week-long repentance for us that the hearts that you touched this morning would continue out of here and really have changed lives expressed in how they honor you and live by lifestyle. Give us compassion for the lost, Lord. Give us compassion for the evil world rulers that we're so upset and angry about. Help us to intercede, Lord, for the lost again and have hearts of compassion, but get ourselves out of the way before we can even do that. We tear down that tree of pride in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Have a great day. Happy Father's Day.